It's always good to have a man of standing open your meeting. Uh, we are in uh, exposition of the book of Proverbs. We are in uh, chapter 18. And this morning we begin with five Proverbs, uh, beginning in verse 11. Let me just say before we begin this morning, uh, I give you Thanksgiving greetings, and I am very grateful uh, and full of Thanksgiving to be back with you uh, at Believer's Chapel and spend another uh, holiday season uh, expounding the Word. I'm grateful for the elders that have invited me to come back and allow me to participate in the exposition of the Scriptures. I am their guest, and I appreciate them all for their kindness to me. Uh, here we begin in verse 11. The wealth of the rich person is his fortified city, and like a high wall in his imagination. Twelve. Before destruction, a person's heart is high and haughty, but before honor is humility. Now, my translation, I do things a little more literally than probably what your translation is, so I have the word before twice in that particular proverb, and I'll address that in the exposition. Thirteen. For the one who replies before listening, it is to him folly and shame. Fourteen, a person's spirit can endure even sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? And finally, verse 15, the heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of wise people seek knowledge. Okay, here is what I think these Proverbs teach, or this is the way I'm going to teach them. Verse 11, right thinking. Right thinking. Verse 12, wrong thinking. Wrong thinking. Verse 13, the consistent behavior of the fool. The consistent behavior of the fool. Verse 14, let's be effective in all our encouragement. Let's be effective in all of our encouragement. And finally, verse 15, regeneration brings an appetite to know. Regeneration brings an appetite to know. So here is our exposition beginning in verse 11. Here we have a striking contrast to the righteous person's true security, which we saw in verse 10 last time we were together. Here, in delusion, the rich seeks his security and significance in his wealth. This opening, the wealth of the rich person, seemingly this is a different proverb than we had contrasted in verse 10 because of the word wealth. But wealth, we need to remind ourselves, is much more than mammon, possessions, material goods. The word wealth is the word kaved. It is the word that we use for honor. It was used of hardening the Pharaoh's heart. It is more than abundance. It is about power. It is about status. 
It is about prestige. It's a mixture of all of those things together. But more about that at the end of the proverb. I was in the oil business in the 80s and 90s, and my partners in Omaha, Nebraska, acquainted me with a name I had never heard before. Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, of course now known internationally, and rightly considered the greatest investor in American history. And I admire him for that. But money, wealth, possessions, is never to be trusted in the book of Proverbs. Abundance, knowledge, certain skills, in whatever form they come. I still often quote to you Dan Duncan's phrase to me, God makes men smart to do smart things. That's the idea here. Uh, it is never to be trusted or relied upon. I think of the words of, uh, of Samson, who after Delilah cut his hair, said, I will just go out as before. Confidence in himself. Confidence in his abilities. He forgot it was all from the Lord. And so our abundance, our wealth, our whatever, status, gifts, talents, should always be used to serve the Lord, making the most of what He has given to us to honor Him. Now that's the apostles' thought in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16. Making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So, this top phrase, this top line, is, he is fortified or strong. The exact same words that we had in verse 10. The figure of a strong city is just like a city wall. In the case of an enemy, as one comes under attack, one finds security behind the elevated walls. And that's the idea. A description that offers maximum protection in the ancient Near East city. But notice the little preposition in. That is your translation in the English Standard Version, the New American Standard, and your King James. Unfortunately, it was left out of the NIV. N is very important in that second line because you see it qualifies the area of study. The focal point of the proverb is the imagination. All the wealth, all the recognition, all the gift, talent, it's all up in one's mind. That's the point of the proverb. Which means the way one perceives himself. And occasionally, in life's direct concourse, we hear it come out. They say, do you know who I am? Obviously, by asking the question, they perceive themselves differently than we do. You see, he thinks... He's worth this or that. He thinks his talent will get him this or that. His name, his recognition will do for him this or that. It is actually a thinking, a, a thinking of the O.J. Simpson murder trial. That he begins his book an explanation in defense of himself. The top line, the opening chapter. Hey, this is O.J. My name, my, rep my recognition, my reputation should mean something to you. That's the idea. 
You see, his mind tells him that he is worth this, that he has that. But you see, it's all up here. In Acts chapter 25, verse 23, we have this word pomp. Entering the audience room where Paul was on trial, the word pomp, it means pageantry. It's the Greek word fantasia. It means light, fleeting, passing, something of momentary interest. Pump. That's the idea. That is in the mind. It's all pump. The wise, you see, he never gets caught up in something like that. He's not interested in the recognition of himself or what he has, or what he is about as far as reputation, not in this life. Who or what he has. We are given that uh, careful admonition from the apostles. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, that I think speaks directly to this proverb. To everyone who is among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought. There it is. What can I do to serve you and you and you? That's what regeneration brings about when you're born again. You are born again to be a priest. That's what the New Testament declares. And that's what we teach here at Believer's Chapel, the priest to the believer. There's no intermediary between us and the Lord. The priest organically has two features. One, he has direct access to the Lord Himself. That's what you were born again to and for. Direct access. And second, the second feature of the priest is he's always serving. He's always working in service. That's what your elders are here to do. That is what the deacons are here to do. And as a growing vital body of Jesus Christ, we are all, all about the service of one another. What can I do for you? And that's reality. We're all priests. I've been reading the history of the Reformation. And something was pointed out to me in my reading that I never really stopped and contemplated before. When a priest in the Roman church is conferred the right to celebrate Mass, the exact ritualistic words are these, and I quote, receive power to sacrifice for the living and the dead. Which according to Romanist dogma, gives the conferee the very power of the Son of God. Now, my friends, that's utter blasphemy. (laughs) I share nothing, nothing with the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is totally unique. He is other. He is distinct. He is separate. If there was one thing that Dr. S. Lewis Johnson branded into the heart and mind of his students was the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, His person, and His work. And he proclaimed it often right here. Now, I am not to emulate Him. I am only to proclaim Him. What He has done who He is, and what He alone has accomplished. And for that, 
the logical explanation is exactly what the apostles tell us in the New Testament. That He rightly is above all of creation. Given a name above every name. That He is above it all. So I say that to exhort us all, and myself, to rightly think about our imaginations, our process regarding ourselves. And the great Westminster thinker, theologian, Cornelius Van Til, would tell us that our thinking about ourselves is never wrong. Never. You see, it's a built-in presupposition with all of us. It's the glasses cemented to our face. And what is that preposition, that presupposition? Well, it's exactly what we have in the book of Proverbs. 21.2, a proverb we haven't gotten to yet, but would agree with Professor Van Til. All a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. That's why we need an objective word outside of ourselves that tells us the truth about ourselves. And so what is the truth? What is the truth of our right thinking? Here it is. From the Apostle, a question that defines us all. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What have you that you have not received? And if you've received it, why do you boast? Why do you think yourself different than anyone else? You see, we're all believer priests right here. We're all servants of one another right here. And that's the purpose that we seek to accomplish. All to the honor and glory of Christ. Right thinking. Here's 12. The, here's the consequences of wrong thinking. Verse 12. Destruction. A proverb that we're all probably familiar with. My translation, I have the preposition before twice. I do things a little bit more literal. Line one and line two there. Only the New King James does that, by the way. Uh, the rest of the translations make it a contrast. Line two with the word but. It's just a style issue for emphasis. But let's remember what the word before is. We don't want to run over words in Proverbs. Before is this, then that. It is a word of order. It is a word of chronology. Now, we have had a proverb like 1812 before. 1618, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Here, pride resists correction. Thus, the proud don't change. They enter into destructive behaviors and they are destroyed. That's the idea. Destruction, we've seen this word before. It means breaking. It means crash. Like a wall that suddenly falls in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 13. Why, we had no idea when we built that wall that it was not on a sure foundation, we say. We saw no cracks. We didn't see a lean in that wall in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And then suddenly, to our shock, it came crashing down. Destruction, that's your word. The word high, here in contrast, we've seen it before. Literally, it's a state of being, is high. 
The person's focus is on himself, which is destructive. But when a person's focus is on the Lord, how different that is. His heart is encouraged. He's full of thanksgiving and praise and worship. For example, Psalm 118, verse 15, Shouts of joy and deliverance resound from the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I can remember back in my seminary days, I was discussing a sermon that I had to listen to by tape. It was S. Lewis Johnson. It was from the book of Revelation, and the title to the sermon was The Anthem of Heaven. And I was talking to a student, a fellow student, two years ahead of me by the name of Jim Cutnow. Jim was bright. Princeton graduate. He was gifted in music. He was very sophisticated. He was everything I wasn't. And I, I told Jim in this conversation, I, I was mesmerized by that, by that message. And I heard it again and again and again on tape. He said, you were mesmerized. I was there. I was in the audience. And then he said this, and I've never forgotten it. He said, you know, when it was all over, I didn't want to go to class. I didn't want to do another thing. I just wanted to stay right there. I wanted to sing. I wanted to praise God out loud. I wanted to pray. That's the idea. That's what focusing upon the Lord is. And that was the text of Dr. Johnson. It was the living creatures. It was the elders surrounding the throne. It was the anthem of heaven. But when such exuberance turns on oneself, then his state of being is destructive. To such a person, the Lord is quite far. At a distance, says the psalmist, 138 verse 6, though the Lord is exalted and looks with compassion on the lowly. But here, the haughty, the high-minded, same word as our proverb, He sees them from afar. So, straightforward thinking. Man is not the measure of all things. No, it's the Lord. He's the measure of everything. And that's why here at Believer's Chapel, we invest so much time and energy in the exposition of the Word. Look at line 2 here, but that's your contrast. And again, before, a word of sequence. Now, there is our word wealth from verse 11. It's honor here to be made heavy. And humility. The lexicon translates the word afflicted. God being the force on the person. He is Afflicting. He is pressing down, if you will. That was the imagery in my mind. Here's the way Moses uses this word. Psalm 90, verse 15. Moses, his request, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted. You have pressed down upon the previous generation in the wilderness and they have died. Now bring us joy and gladness coming out of this wilderness and this spiral of death and into the land that You have promised. And this is, of course, the great word used by Isaiah the prophet in association with our Lord's suffering and death. 
Isaiah 53, verse 4. We're familiar with the lyric language of the King James. Surely He has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and there it is, afflicted, pressed down upon. When you think about it, this second line in the proverb, it actually is a picture of the life of Christ itself. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And then the suffering upon the cross under the mighty hand of the Father. Then honored, made heavy, conveyed, wealthy, rich, beyond anything we could ever think of in life or in all creation. Here's the way the apostle described it for us. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That's the word honored. That's the word heavy. That's what affliction and suffering gave to Jesus Christ. And for that reason, we come together and often sing, crown Him with many crowns, the Lamb upon His throne. We give Him worship and praise for what He has accomplished unto Himself. Here's 13. As for the one who replies before listening, it is to him folly and shame. A proverb about the fool's arrogance. Often speaking impulsively without really listening or reflecting on what was spoken. This opening in the top line, it refers to, a, to one's focus. The focus of their attention. You probably have he who rather than the one who, that's just a style feature. The reply is literally a word to return. See how literal the, the ancient languages were? A word to return, rather than reply. So physical, you almost see these words come alive. It's really an idiom here. It's a... Uh, what you and I understand as an answer. There is our word before again. Order, chronology. It infers that one interrupts, interrupts before a point is made clearly. Listening, which means to be attentive closely. We would say careful attention to something. Listening. Now I find this insightful. The one who is speaking is actually hidden in the proverb. Take a look at it very closely again. You see, he is the one being interrupted. And the ancient rabbis considered that to be the voice of the wise who was actually speaking and the fool interrupted. And of course, here, line two shows the in interpretation. He is the fool who is notorious for sprouting, spouting out his own opinions rather than being instructed. Now, look at that, this circumstantial clause that interprets the fool's behavior. Look at it. It is to him. You see that? Two things here if we diagram this out. The first would be folly, meaning he's a thick-headed person and this is the way he behaves. This is his course of conduct. The folly of fools. It's put on display. Therefore, in all of his concourse of life, he is always certain about his own points of view. And here's the second interpretation of this behavior. Shame. 
It's an epithet, a label, a way that this person is identified, he or she. It's disgusting. It's disgraceful. They don't listen. They don't care to listen. They have their own minds, their own agenda. I just listen to the press conferences in Washington, shouting, yelling, the profanity. It's disgraceful. And it's a fool's behavior. Behavior that marks the fool lives in his own world, thinking himself right about everything. And there is Professor Van Til again, teaching us from his theology that that built-in presupposition that every man has, he's always right. And remains that way, except he be regenerated and hear an outside voice from his own heart. Here's 14. A person's spirit can endure even sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? Proverb here about that is an observation of the human psyche. A positive attitude can have a positive effect upon one's health. Spirit here. We've seen this term before in Proverbs. It occurs 21 times. It can refer to a blowing wind or it can refer to the breath of life with the individual. The context determines how we are to take it. Here it's very clear. It's an individual. His individual spirit, and if that spirit is broken, his vitality, we call it morale, his ability to promote life and move forward is broken, it's disrupted, even destroyed. We have an example of this in the Scriptures, 1 Kings 21.4. Naboth tells wicked King Ahab, I'm not going to do your real estate transaction that you want the adjacent property to my northern summer palace in Samaria. This was the land God gave to my ancestors, and by faith, I'm going to work it and keep it. And as a result, the wicked king, the Scripture says, turns himself to the wall, will see no one, or eat nothing. The book of Proverbs puts a great deal of stress on communication. Actually, how we speak to one another. We can, with the Spirit, build one another up. Or with the same instrument, the tongue, we can tear one another down. By wisdom, the skill for living, the same vehicle, the tongue, it builds people up and encourages them. And through our own wickedness and our own devices, we harm ourselves in our communication. Ecclesiastes 7, 8, better than the end of a matter than the beginning. And the patient in spirit, there's your same word used by Solomon, is better than the proud in spirit. Now I know a football coach in the Big Ten Conference. And in a conversation that I had with him, he said he can no longer coach an individual position. He's a bright, brilliant guy. And he said, I just don't have the patience for it anymore. I'm too much of a critic. And I can tell I harm people with my criticism. Therefore, he is a coordinator and an excellent one. So in all our ways, we want to try to handle people's spirits effectively. That's what the proverb is teaching us. So here, our top line. 
can endure. That's an interesting concept. It means to supply resources within, we say, that person has a very strong constitution. Once someone described to me an individual who was weak-minded. That was the term that was used. I said, I've never heard that before. They said, well, you look at them wrongly and they just fall apart. Now, in ministry, we must learn to be effective with all types of personalities. This word sickness can refer to any malady in general. 2 Chronicles 21.15, it specifically refers to something long and lingering. The top line declares that one's psyche or constitution enables one if given encouragement to go from strength to strength. And that was the apostles. They were encouragers. Encouragers to us. And speak to us that way. Now look at this who. That's open-ended. It can mean anyone. Anyone to bear. Now, that word is the idea to lift. And so it comes in the form of a question. Who can lift one up with a broken spirit? So line two, when the spirit is gone, when it is broken, here's the idea. That a person is defeated. It's defeat. And when that occurs, vitality is gone. And one falls even into serious depression. Our ministry is to encourage as much as possible and to build one another's faith on every occasion and to keep our communication as one which is positive. And that's effective ministry. Finally, here's 15. A heart of the discerning acquires knowledge. Man is never in neutral. Never. He is either growing wiser or born a fool and degenerating into a mark, a mocker, the hardest of the incorrigibles. Our top line opens the heart of the discerning. This is an insight. Knowing what needs to be done and how to do it. And here the wise acquires knowledge. The Spirit of God regenerates the soul and turns the lights on in your mind. That's the idea. Here, acquiring knowledge, the wise listen and they follow wisdom. Listen to the exhortation of the book of Proverbs to us all. Four, five. Get wisdom. Get insight. Get prudence. Get instruction. Don't turn aside to this way or that. Stay on the path. This word acquired, used in Genesis 34, of the men of Shechem desiring to make an acquisition of Jacob's livestock. Line 2. Look at this. Don't pass over it. The ears. That's so important. You see, our pilgrimage is always one of hearing. Never seen. We listen to the Lord. He speaks to us through His Word. And we follow it. Now, I'm never to expect to see Him. And I don't, wouldn't believe it if I saw it. A vision, I wouldn't believe it. Because I know what the Scriptures say. My way to the truth is the Word of God. I am to focus on that and nothing else. Now, here at the end, look at this. Because you know, you seek 
Here's the meaning of the word to seek. It means to secure. And here it is. Jeremiah 45.5 Do you seek great things for yourselves? Seek them not. You see, men of the world seek great things here, in the here and now. What we as believers seek is the Lord. The Lord. With all of our might. I desire a heart to secure wisdom, knowledge of the Word, and performance of that Word. Not as a hearer only, but a doer. That's what the believer is. I desire righteousness in every area of my life. And somewhere in the heavenlies, the angels are snickering. Of course, I'm such a fool. And I'm so weak and paltry and pitiful. But that's the desire. And that's what I seek to maintain. Job put it this way, I put on righteousness as my clothing. I couldn't stand in Job's shadow. But I have the passion and the zeal and the want to to acquire it, to secure it for myself. And I want it for you as well. Feed on the Word of God. Feed on the Scriptures. Put them in your mind. And you'll be there. And then you'll live a great life. And you'll do impossible things. Ask Peter. He walked on water. And you'll see the power of the One you proclaim. Jesus the Christ who works in you and through you and by you for His own glory's sake. And that's the proverb. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for uh, this Word this morning. How grateful we are for this class, uh, for the leadership of this class uh, from people like Warren and so many others that are a constant encouragement to us all. Thank you for the elders, the deacons of this church, for their service, their commitment to you. And Lord, uh, so grateful for the years of constant service out of this building. We, Your priests, carry on Your service as the priests of old, night and day in the temple to the honor and glory of Christ. Strengthen us to that end. Give us zeal and passion to that end. For our work will never be in vain. It will always Render honor and glory to You who is eternal forever and ever. In Jesus' name, Amen.